Peter started his career as a software engineer at Microsoft in Redmond. I've been to Redmond, a great place. I've been to <laughs> Bill Gates um, Smart House. Uh, at that Ooh. time, was, that was 2007, if I recall correctly. So at that time, Smart House was a very interesting and exciting uh, concept. Um, so uh, Peter has co-founded uh, Personal Agility Institute and as well as World Agility Forum. Peter is currently working on his second book called Personal Agility, Six Questions to Change Your Life. Uh, and last but not least, Peter is probably the only person on this conference with whom we can check if Agile Breakfast in Zurich is as good as here in Vilnius. Leo, I hope you know that, that because you know you're you're you and your, your colleagues, you're driving the breakfast here in Vilnius. So we have to check this out. Peter, take it away. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Kind of with that, with that introduction, the Agile Breakfast is very um, you know, close to my heart because I started the Agile Breakfast. At the time, we called it Scrum Breakfast in Zurich back in 2007. And it's really great to hear that this you know, concept is, is propagating. And so every Agile Breakfast I've ever been to is awesome, and I'm sure yours is too. But I look, for the, I look forward to the opportunity uh, maybe next time around when the um, you know, the C word is, is not uh, restricting travel so much that we can, or not restricting, we can travel, but, but getting together for a conference is challenging. Anyway, I look forward to, to tasting the coffee. So what I would like to do is I'm gonna share my screen. One thing which I would like to do is I'm gonna go over to the, um, to our WOVA site. And if you'll, you'll see that we got a couple of polls going on, okay? so. I got a total of five polls. Um, the first one is you know, a little bit of self-destruction, self-description. Who are you? Self-destruction. That was a Freudian slip, self-description. Then a couple of questions about how you feel about work, how you feel about your, um, you know, the value of the work that you're doing, um, how much confidence you have that, that you're doing the right thing. And so we're going to come back to this at the, uh, at the end of the talk. And, uh, you know, so if you just like to uh, drop in here, um, by the way, I'd like to, these questions were invented by a gentleman named Joe Justice. Uh, and you're going to see his name kind of reappearing through my, um, through my presentation. I see he's on track three this afternoon. So if you want to, uh, if you want to meet an amazing guy or hear an amazing talk, um, that is the, the, the second one on my list. The other is unfortunately directly conflicting with mine, which is Frederic, who's going to, who's going more into the details of how you do uh, what I'm about to describe. So, uh, Peter, before, um, you, before yes. you continue, I just want to everyone to highlight to everyone who participates on the conference that in order to participate in a poll and ask questions, you have to switch the session. All right. So there on the left hand side, you have the agenda. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you are mm -hmm. on the right session, because otherwise mm -hmm. you're just on the wrong session, not being able to ask questions. Thank you. OK. And I saw that the chat in Zoom has actually been disabled. So what that means is we're going to ask questions in the in the session tool with Wova. Um, so let's get started. Now, with any luck, let's just double check that the screen sharing is working. You should see the I three secrets of agile leadership. Yes. Are we good? And you should see the, the presentation screen, not the presenter screen. OK. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. You've actually kind of covered you know, who I am and what I do. Um, the, I've got my LinkedIn up uh, here in the list. I've also, I'm also in the, um, uh, the list of people suggesting to connect with each other on LinkedIn. So if you'd like to connect with me, that would be awesome. Um, the most important work I'm doing right now is related to the Personal Agility Institute, which Maria Mattarelli and I co-founded. Um, as we started working with Personal Agility, um, Personal agility is the simple framework for aligning what you do with what you really care about, okay? And you can apply that in a personal context or a work context. And what we discovered is that people were transforming their lives, you know, going from struggling to thriving, turning their businesses around, you know, basically doing amazing things by applying the stuff that we've all learned how to do in software and applying it to the more basic questions of your life, okay? And so, you know, we envision a world where people live and work according to things that really matter. And we're now a network of people around the world. 
And we've seen, you know, just looking at some of the early cases that we had in the US, if just 1% of the people who could benefit from personal agility did benefit from personal agility, that would be millions of people. Okay, so what we really want to do is enable literally millions of people to change their lives, change their situation measurably and obviously for the better. And, and we think it's possible just by applying the simple basic framework. So um, we got a couple of questions in there in the, um, in the poll, um, you know, related to what you do, related to how confident you are that you're working on the highest value project in your business that your time is spent efficiently and that you're happy at work. Now, I'm going to go into the who is in the room question now. We've got 82 results. Um, so we have, let's see, 12% developers, 7% agilists. No one is claiming to be anti-agile. You know, I keep hearing how horrible agility is and, and LinkedIn and how agile is dead. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that that's not the case. Um, 37% are in an agile leadership role. So scrum master, product owner, agile coach, couple of project managers, um, that's great. Did you know the first book, and actually it was the second book on, on scrum was called Agile Project Management with Scrum. So don't let people get too excited about titles and descriptions. Um, line managers, we even have one or two people uh, responsible for their company or for a business unit, that's amazing. And a couple of people who will call aliens something else uh, maybe you want to share in the chat, uh, you know, kind of what, you, what you're doing, okay? And what's really great here is to have the diversity, okay? The intellectual diversity of having different roles, different people in the same room. Um, because the alternative is to have all of the project managers together, all of the developers together, all of the C-suite together, not talking to each other and getting mutually frustrated about what the other group is doing and how we're doing our best, but they're not. And so, you know, getting people together you know, across functions, across um, competencies, and, and one of them is decision-making, that proves to be a hugely both challenging but also valuable practice in an agile transformation. So let's kind of get into the substance here. Um, the, you know, you've met me, you've heard about most of what I do. Um, this is me with my son at Joe Justice's or at the Wikispeed factory uh, about three or four years ago. My son was about 14 at the time and we were applying agility to the problem of building a car. And, you know, I live in Switzerland. That means we live in postage stamps. We don't have garages in the basement where we can do things like work on cars. Um, but Maximilian and I, we got there. Um, we spent a day with Joe and, and this was William, his chief product owner at the time. And by the end of that day, we had learned enough about auto mechanicing that we could uh, remove the body, remove the wheels, remove the brakes, disconnect the steering, um, remove the suspension. That was actually what the whole thing was about. Attach the suspension, attach the, attach the brakes, attach the wheels, align the steering, um, start up the car and drive it around by the end of the day. And by the end of that day, we're able to do it ourselves. And the basic technique that they applied was pairing. So my big aha moment from that was, you know, the skills that we have in agility, they're almost universally useful. You can use them to build a car, you can use them to, divine, to develop software, you can use them to develop integrated circuits or make medical devices. This is really fundamental how we collaborate. So what happens when we say as executives, we wanna be agile? How do executives, okay, we said this, is, this talk is about leadership. So when I go into an executive workshop, um, I start out, I often get questions like this. What are buzzwords about? What is all the buzzwords about this agile stuff? You know, agility arose from, how shall I say, delivery teams, people building stuff, be it, be it virtual stuff like software, maybe more physical stuff. Um, most executives and leaders don't work in a team. They're responsible for teams. They're responsible for divisions. But, you know, just the whole language was wrong and the whole context was wrong. Once we get past the buzzwords and discover that there's substance behind this, then we start to find out, well, what are, the, what are executives looking for, okay? And it's about being able to innovate. It's about being able to break down silos, get people talking to, to each other, getting, being able to develop better products. Um, maybe a little bit, you get a little bit further into it and you say, well, what does this mean for our clients and how do we have to educate them? And you know, how does this help us you know, do a better job at getting our customers excited about us? Okay, and then it comes back down to the personal again. How can I make it a success? And what does it mean for me? Now, 
what I'm going to do is I want to share with you kind of my experience working with leaders and show a couple of stories which show how universal agility is, okay, as a leadership principle. Now, before we do that, I'd actually like to touch on the question, what does it mean to be agile? Okay, everyone talks about the agile mindset, but no one really seems to be able to agree on what it means. So I'd like to actually go back to the Agile Manifesto and say, well, what is this mindset? Where do we find the mindset in the manifesto? Then we have the three secrets that I've promised you. And, and yes, I'm going to reveal the secrets, not just yet. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to apply those secrets in real life. So are you with me? Okay, so let's start talking about what does it mean to be agile? Now, this is the point where I say, uh, hold on guys here, this could be a little bit risky. I've, I've, people have talked me into getting rid of the impolite language, but the inconvenient truths, they just don't go away, okay? So managerial discretion is advised beyond this point. So if anyone wants to go into a safer session, now is the time to do it. Um, you still with me? Okay, so let's, let's move on. What does it mean to be agile? Now, agile is, as we use the term today, you know, basically traces its roots to the Agile Manifesto. 17 software developers got together and said, you know, what do we need to work effectively? Okay, and their message basically amounted to management, would you please give us some space so we can do our jobs? Okay, so it's kind of a bottom up thing. Now, obviously this message, you know, this give us some space, this, this did not play well, but after a while, people started to notice that it worked. Okay, and then this new thing appeared, which in some ways was almost worse than what we had before. This was fake agile. Um, and you know, we'll talk about you know, kind of what are the characteristics of fake agility and how do you recognize it? A third step <clears throat> is there were actually companies that started to apply agility at the top levels of the organization. Okay, you know, billion dollar companies, they, Steve Denning uh, was very proud of the trillion dollars of market capitalization that was represented in his first um, in his first learning consortium, okay? And there they discovered certain practices that were common to the, <clears throat> the company striving to be agile at a corporate level. So let's take a look at them. So <clears throat> now a lot of people, when they talk about agility, they talk about practices, they talk about tools, they talk about all of these wonderful things. And, you know, I am personally a great fan of Scrum. I'm, I've used most of these things. Um, the... I'm even a fan of Kanban, although it's not the, uh, uh, the banner on my, um, uh, on my shingle. You know, but all of these practices were developed by people who basically had the agile mindset. And these were tools to enable them to live their mindset, to work the way they wanted to work. Okay? And this might be a homework, a homework assignment. Have a conversation as to whether that description also applies to SAFE. So when we go back to the um, Agile Manifesto, Okay, this is, the, this is the document, 73 words, I think 78 if you count the title, or no, 68 if you don't count the title. Um, what, what, it, what is the way, what are these better ways of developing software? Okay, and this somehow became a movement. Now, where in it do you see the mindset? Okay, now I personally, oh, and by the way, I'm very much indebted to Joe Justice on this point, because he was the first one who explained this to me uh, at a workshop in Vietnam. If you take a look at that first sentence in the Agile Manifesto, the one no one ever talks about, and the first principle in, in the second page, the page that no one looks at, this is where you find the Agile mindset, in my humble opinion. We are uncovering better ways okay, of developing software. It turns out you can ignore the developing software part and put almost anything else in its place, and it still works. So we're uncovering better ways of doing what we do by doing it and helping others to do it. Okay, so we see learning and collaboration. And then we go to that first principle. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. Blah, 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 something about software, which could be different in a different context. Okay, so what we have is learning, collaboration, and purpose. So, you know, in my eyes, these three elements sum up what it means to be agile. We have an attitude that values learning, we value collaboration, and we know why we're doing what we're doing, not just how to do what we're doing or what has to be done by when. Now, what is fake agility? Well, you know, in the early days, this was developed by practitioners, okay? And so the software guys would go to the business guys and say, hey, we wanna be agile. We wanna do Scrum or extreme programming or something like that. And the problem is no one outside the software development really cared. 
And the idea, the best you could get was, well, you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't impact my bonus. So you kind of got this pushback. Okay, that was round one. Um, and so what, what happened in the early days of, of Scrum projects is we found ourselves creating islands of common sense. You know, there's a war going on out there. We have this island of common sense, okay? And this was not something that Scrum invented, but it was something that, that Scrum was able to implement very, uh, very effectively. The next level is it was in some ways more challenging because this is when top management had realized, hey, wow, this agile stuff works. Let's have everybody do Scrum. So we get the command do Scrum. Um, we bring in the consultants, we bring in the flood of practices, and, and everyone gets hit by this tidal wave, and wow, what do we do next? Okay, and so when, when you hear a lot of this agile is dead stuff, I think this is a lot about fake agility, people applying tools and practices, but without the values. It's kind of like what happened to, to uh, the Toyota production system when it came to the West in the 80s. Um, they lost the Toyota way. They lost the values. They only got the practices. And that made lean kind of a scary thing in the early days. Okay. Now, what's the synthesis? Well, this is the work of Steve Denning. Steve Denning started life out as, as a manager at the World Bank. He was a fairly senior executive, not quite, not quite the C-level, but he was responsible for a um, very large part of the organization. Um, he discovered leadership storytelling as a way to lead and inspire change. And, and for a long time, he was the Ken Schraber of the storytelling community going around the world and, you know, sharing the, sharing the message until after he'd been, been doing that for about 10 years. And then he realized every place he'd planted storytelling, it was dying. And he found that the cause of that death was management which rather systematically killed any creative initiatives that, that came into the companies. And so he started to dig deeper. Um, that led him to write his second book, which was Radical Management. Um, and he actually thought he was gonna have to reinvent management and was pleasantly surprised to discover things like Lean and Scrum and a couple of other things where you know, these, these, these creative practices were actively being applied. Um, this book brought him in contact with the Scrum Alliance who invited him to join their board of directors. Um, where he started um, a group called the Learning Consortium. And he simply asked the question, are there any companies out there who are trying to be agile? And he found about a half a dozen or about a dozen. And as I say, about a trillion dollars of market capitalization, which back then was considered a big number um, and, and said, okay, what are they doing? And what he found were three things, okay? The first thing he called the law of the customer. Okay, which is that these organizations had a focus on customer needs, not just on their existing customers, but even more importantly, on creating new customers and new markets. The second he called the law of the network. Okay, so information flows freely through the company. This means you can react to issues and you can seize opportunities. Okay, we look at Clayton Christensen with, with disruptive innovation, top management basically ignoring the advice of people much closer to the value zone, value zone than themselves. That's actually a documented failure pattern. And this is the opposite is the law of the network, ensuring that the information flows freely and gets acted on quickly. And finally, the law of the small teams. We need to have business and technology people working together efficiently and effectively to create customer-centric products. Now, I, I, I talk with Steve on a regular basis and, and, and we had some spirited debates as to whether his version of agility and the developer's version of agility is kind of on the same page or not until you compare them. So in Steve's eyes, you know, agility is the network, the law of the network, the law of small teams and the law of the customer. Well, if you match that up to the essence of agility from the agile manifesto, the customer represents purpose, the network is for learning, and small teams are there to ensure collaboration. And so what we discover is that agility at the top levels of business and agility at the level of a software team are really very much the same, okay? There is no disconnect between these two things. We just haven't realized it yet, okay? When I go into workshops with executives to help them make improvements, one of the things I've discovered is that most of their wishes map very nicely onto one of the three laws of agility. So the chances are good that being more agile is going to be helpful to your company. So, and you know, this, this is this is being noticed. Okay, the first article uh, in the Harvard Business Review was published, I think, five years ago now. Uh, co-production between Bain and Jeff Sutherland. I think they've now published a second article. A couple of years later, the New York, the Wall Street Journal had picked up picked up on it. Notice how they gave that a classical management twist. 
Are you agile enough? You should be afraid of this agile movement. Are you agile enough for agile management? Okay. And actually, this is one of the big, I think one of the big challenges we have is that you know, in most organizations, you're not allowed to make mistakes, but making mistakes are essential for moving forward in a creative context. So I promised you three secrets. Here they are. You didn't really expect me to just come out with it, did you? No, no, no. We're going to do this on the dropper one at a time. Let's start with the first secret of agile leadership. Okay. And this is a statement probably most of the coaches in the room are going to scream at me. They're going to say, no, 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 no. Change is hard. I disagree with that. Change is easy if you want to do it. Now, one of the problems is most organizations, they don't invest any time in ensuring that people want to do the change. So surprise, surprise, there's a lot of resistance. But let me give you an example. Um, this is a rather personal example of change, okay? Losing weight, okay? This is the, this is the scourge of the modern era. Uh, either you have too much to eat or not enough, depending on where you live. And about three years ago now, I, I had picked on ten, picked up an extra 10 kilos. Now, on the scale of how overweight you can be, 10 kilos is not that big a deal. Um, but on the other hand, um, it was getting in the way. It was noticeable. It, it was, yeah. I, I, I deep down, I knew I had to do something about it. Oddly enough, well, I, I, I wanted to do something about it, but it, but it never quite got over the threshold of really wanting to do something. Oh yeah, I should do it. Now, how does agility help you lose weight? Okay, because when we think of agility, you know, we usually think of something like, like a Kanban board or a task board, stuff, in pro stuff that's waiting, stuff in progress, stuff that's done. And, but you're gonna eat every day. So, you know, what's the point of managing that on a task board, okay? It's, it's not about doing things, it's about not doing things or, or maybe about doing things differently that you were gonna do anyway. Well, in my case, it wasn't so much losing weight that or the desire to lose weight that helped me. It was one day a friend of mine said to me, how does that food make you feel? Have you ever noticed that sugar high? I said, sugar high, nah, never heard of it. Well, you know, if you ate, you know, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you know, that reduces to sugar fairly quickly. And then you get this high and then you get this low and you've got no energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So the following Friday, I had pizza for lunch and, you know, pizza's mostly crust and so mostly carbohydrates. And so guess how I felt in the afternoon? Ugh, no energy. And this is, I said, ah, that's what they were talking about. You know, I don't like how sugar makes me feel. And that's just there's something, this, this emotional connection between how I felt and then kind of connecting how I felt with what I was doing. So what I did is, is I, I, I kind of ended up with this sentence. I don't like how sugar makes me feel, so I want to avoid sugar and carbohydrates. Now, it turns out if your consumption of carbohydrates goes below a certain level, your body switches gears. And instead of um, you know, adding fat to your belly line, it starts consuming the fat. And so by avoiding carbohydrates, you just give your body a subtle hint that it's time to get rid of the fat. And a couple of weeks later, it, it starts going down without you really having to do that much. So you're eating, you're not hungry, but you're not eating carbs. So this is called a keto diet. And at least for me, it worked fairly well. Um, and so I would get to a counter like this. Now, at the time I was doing a lot of traveling, spending a lot of time in business class hotels. And that's a fairly typical breakfast counter which as you can probably gather is about 80% cream and 90% sugar and, and whatever. And I would get to that and I would be like the vegetarian at the meat counter. Oh man, nothing for me here and move on and find some, something else, okay? So how does this translate into real life? Well, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine for the moment, you're the captain of a sailing ship, okay? Before there were, you know, before there were motors and definitely before there was GPS and you're trying to navigate to a faraway point across the ocean. And in this example, we go from Portugal to Jamaica. So how do you get there? Well, the basic idea is first you plot your course. You say, okay, this is, here's where I am, here's where I'm going, you know, and then you kind of connect the dots and you say, okay, I expect to be here after an hour, there after an hour, there after an hour. In a sailboat, you probably do it in days. In fact, how do you even know where you are in the middle of the ocean? Okay, there are no street posts, there are no street signs. And in fact, what you have to do, a uh, major in, uh, accomplishment of, of humanity is to figure out how to navigate. And it turns out, if you look at what stars are coming up over the horizon at sunset, if you look at 
you know, how high up in the sky the pole star is uh, or the Southern Cross, depending, um, and you look at what time it is, you can figure out your position. So what do you do? You set sail, wait for that first sunset and say, where am I? Okay, and if you're on course, that's good. And if you're not on course, you need to change course. Okay, so this is, this is the basics of navigation. And today we use GPSs and they help us a lot, but it's, it's still basically the same, uh, the same idea. So now that, that Jamaica, that, that represents important stuff, long-term goals. What happens if you get caught in a storm? Okay, now if we think of that boat, you know, pretty much any boat is small compared to the ocean. Um, and, and if you look at this picture, you know, you'll notice a couple of challenges here. First of all, how are we going to measure the position of the stars or the sun uh, or notice the, the sunset, you know, when the sky is completely obscured like this? Okay, and you might notice that those waves are fairly large compared to the boat. They don't have to get much bigger. And they'll be crashing over the side of the boat. So you may have bigger problems than getting to Jamaica at this point. You might be worried about the boat sinking. You know, and in general, they say, if the boat sinks, game over. Okay, and that's generally considered to be not a good thing. So all of these, the, the, the storm, this represents urgent work. So what do you do in a case like this? Well, the basic idea is don't let the boat sink. Okay, now for me, you know, so this, 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 this whole thing happened in August. By the time we got to the end of beginning of November, or sorry, beginning of December, um, you know, I was down about eight kilos and I wanted to lose 10. So I was feeling pretty good. And I don't know if you recognize things. These, these are peanut butter cups from Trader Joe's. And the description, I'll, I'll let the description speak for itself. And for some reason, my entire family decided what I really needed was about a half a kilo of uh, peanut butter cups each. So I ended up with about two kilos of peanut butter cups at Christmas time. Now, these are definitely mostly, mostly sugar and carbs. And I, I, I tried to get, you know, my family to eat some of them. But, you know, January... Well, I did what I had to do, and I, I took care of those peanut butter cups, every single one of them, okay? And remember those eight kilos that I lost? Well, I found two of them again, okay? So I was now back to minus six. Now, in the navigation metaphor, I have just hit a major storm, and I'm not going to Jamaica anymore. I'm on my way to Antarctica. Now, you might decide that you want to go to Antarctica. It could be an interesting place, but my destination was someplace else. And so how do you get back on course? Well, the first thing to do is recognize that you're off course, okay? And then you can ask yourself the question, ah, where is Jamaica? Now, in my case, that was, how do I feel about carbs? How do I feel about my weight? Well, you know, I still don't like how carbs make me feel, and I'm still not happy with my weight. So, you know, I went back to reminding myself, I want to avoid carbs. Okay, now you might notice how I left myself a little out there. I want to avoid carbs. I didn't say I'm not gonna eat any because as soon as I eat some, then I failed. But if I want to avoid them, well, I'll avoid them tomorrow. Okay, you know, I give myself permission to fail and that actually makes it, makes it a bit easier. Um, what enabled me to do it? Um, well, by remembering what I wanted to do, okay? And remembering what you want to do. Often people talk about willpower, but I think it's just, remember what you want to do, phrase it in the terms of something you care about, okay? Now, the thing is, it's your boat. You get to decide where it goes. If you don't have your hand in the rudder, it will go someplace, you know, you'll get, you'll get tossed around and, and the, the, the winds and the currents and the waves will take you someplace. But if you want to set a destination, well, um, it's your boat. Now, when we talk about change being easy, if you want to do it, um, I was at a financial institution, classic, classic blame culture. Okay, something goes wrong. You know, the first thing that did is everyone said, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. He did it, she did it. I did what I had to do. Okay, classic responsibility process issues. The, I actually triggered something of a firestorm. I won't get into the details of how I did it, um, but it made very obvious that they had this huge blame culture. I sat down with my customer and I explained to him what a trust culture was and, and why he wanted one. And he agreed, he did want one. Uh, he was a second line manager in this organization. The, the group was about 80 people. Um, so we have my, my customer, the second line manager. He got to, together with his partner and, you know, basically the two second line ran, managers ran the whole organization. They got together, decided they wanted a trust culture. I helped them formulate a memo uh, with the retrospective prime directive. We sent it to everyone. We apologized profusely for what, for what happened. And two days later, it was like being in a different company. 
because I said, we're going to stop attacking people anymore because we know it doesn't help anything. OK, we want to solve problems, not waste our time arguing with people. So you can make change happen like that. The key is that you want to do it. OK, and if the influential people want to do it, then there's nothing, uh, nothing stopping you from making change happen. So that's my first thing. Change is easy if you want to do it. If you want to make change happen, you know, help people understand why they want to do it. They'll want to do it, too. And then all of a sudden it's done. So let's go on to our second principle. Be clear on what really matters. Clarity of purpose. So <clears throat> one of my early, um, early, early assignments as a personal agility coach, a gentleman named Jürg, Jürg Ewald, and he had invested, basically taken over a small specialty manufacturer of airline parts, or sorry, of, of uh, aircraft parts. And th there's hot air ballooning. Okay, so he, his company made altimeters. And when he came to me, he says, Peter, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm desperate. I don't know what to do. I've got so much work. Um, I just can't, I just can't keep up with it all. And so he had like seven or eight, you know, lots and lots of different priorities. We sat down together, um, helped him understand, okay, well, what do you have to do? We started grouping them into, you know, categories to understand why they were important. Um, and you know, finally, I, you know, we looked at this list. It was all about work. And I said, you know, what is this all about? And he says, well, you know, it's about saving my company. I want to save my company. Okay. Why don't you, and, and we were operating with, with kind of a Kanban board, which, which we call the priorities map. And the, the first thing, the first column in our priorities map is what really matters. And so I said, okay, well, why don't you put save your company as number one on what really matters? Because that seems to be it. And he said, okay. So he made the label, took everything home, um, came back two weeks later. Um, feeling very unsatisfied because he was still working like crazy and there was still too much to do and there were all these priorities. And, you know, basically what had happened is, is the company wasn't doing well financially, so he had to let people go. And then he tried to take up the slack himself. And so after the second session, you know, we kind of adjusted it. He, he wasn't very satisfied, but, but you know, we, we more than used up the time, so he walked out of the office. Um, and just as he left the office, he had this aha moment. OK. Well, we went through all this. We created a map that looked much like this. Upper left, upper left hand corner. I want to save my company. He walked out. He had the aha moment. Yes, I want to save my company. But what I really want to do is have a decent life. Took that home. Uh, it was like six o'clock. So he went home to his wife, opened the door. Honey, I'm home. Honey, I've come to, I've come to a realization. And she's saying, oh, OK, um, you know, you know, I really want to save the company. Yeah. Well, I also want to have a decent life. And she said, oh, that's interesting. What does that mean? And he said, well, how about we go see a movie tonight? <sighs> you haven't suggested that in a year and a half. OK, so so here is the thing. When you get this clarity on what really matters, you can communicate it, you can explain it. And people will understand the difference right away. OK, you know, and I, I've seen examples of this. Um, the Apollo program was used to teach smart goals. We're going, you know, uh, the American goal was was to land a man on the moon before the decade was out. Um, this, you know, we talk about a computer on every desktop and Microsoft software at every computer. That was Microsoft's vision back in the day when I was there. You know, clear, you know, clear goals that people understand. OK, now that's pretty well understood. But there's another part of it. And this is something I've really just discovered. And, you know, maybe, maybe um, uh, the folks will invite me back to talk about emergence uh, at a later date. You know, we, we talk about purpose, but there's also the individuals and the interactions with each other. And so if you look at that flock of birds, okay, say, well, where is the flock? There is no flock. There's just birds. But there is a flock. And the, the, the flock is created by the birds interacting with each other. OK, so this is we call this emergence. And this is this is how groups of individuals interact with each other to produce something greater than themselves. Now, it turns out that works for people. It works for atoms forming molecules. It works for molecules for forming proteins. It works for teams forming companies. OK, companies forming alliances, communities forming nations. OK, this concept of emergence is really fundamental. And what's interesting is when you can have simple rules of behavior to keep the flock together, okay? 
behavior, this is how we make culture actionable. Okay, so for instance, one of my favorite rules is um, listen before you talk, ask before you tell. Okay, and you get simple, simple rules of engagement like this. Can we agree to do this at our workshop today? And all of a sudden you get a completely different character in your workshop, completely different characters in your meetings. We, we did the, um, uh, I told you the story of the retrospective prime directive, assuming good intent. We made that the culture of the company, the culture changed to today. This is how you can affect change is through clarity. On the one hand, clarity of purpose, but also clarity and expectation. The, um, how you interact with each other, okay? And the amazing thing is people will notice the difference right away. So clarity of purpose. Let's go on to our third secret. Software developers already know how to do this. It is the best kept secret of management, how to manage complexity. And I'd like to share the story of a manager who got it, who understood it. This was a customer of mine here in Zurich. His name is Walter Stulzer. He was executive, still is executive director of a creative consultancy, okay? And his fast seat after the fact was they wanted to change, but they were literally unable to do so. So what happened? Well, FutureWorks emerged out of a, a um, there were several partners in a larger consultancy. Um, they didn't see their future together, so they split into several smaller consultancies. And Walter's part, Walter was one of these partners um, and he took FutureWorks with him, okay? Now, Walter wanted to take a step back from the daily business. He wanted to pass, pass the torch on to the next generation of leadership. Now, it turns out that the, a torch, the, the company torch is actually quite a burden to bear because you have to think like an entrepreneur. You have to be able to generate the business and, and keep the company going. And so, you know, they did what you do is they, they defined a number of measures, okay? Um, they allocated 10% of their time as leaders. So this is a consulting company. So, you know, 10% of their capacity is quite a lot. And they then started a number of initiatives and they gave themselves two years to succeed on these initiatives. That was kind of their, their milestone, their time box, okay? And those two years went by and somehow nothing ever really got done or, well, maybe some things got done or, well, how many of those initiatives do you think were done two years later? Okay, by the way, two years later is where I got involved. Um, the original statement was none. Two years of work, nothing done to transform the company. The company was, was still having challenges. Um, I later discovered that wasn't quite true. One of the things they did is they got a name and a logo. And so they were kind of able to present themselves, but that didn't really address the underlying financial problems that they were having. So this is where I got involved and, and we taught them, I taught them about personal agility and I taught them about Scrum and they started applying, uh, Walter started applying personal agility himself and they started applying Scrum in the leadership team. So the situation was basically the same as before with a couple of small differences. First of all, Walter himself committed to being part of the solution, trained with the team both, uh, on Scrum and personal agility. Again, they dedicated 10% 10 10 of their capacity, but this time they worked in sprints. Now they still had this overall budget uh, of two years. They said, okay, we wanna have this done in two years. Although actually Walter was doing his best poker face because in six months, they probably would have had financial problems. Okay. Um, so six months later, okay. And by the way, that is to scale that crawling. That was the two years going by that zoom that's in proportion the six months going by. The number of initiatives is also proportional. They had achieved all of their goals. The most important goal was that the company was sustainable on a financial basis. Another important goal was that they, they arrest the, they, they stop the turnover in personnel so that they've got some stability in the organization. Within six months, they were able to turn that around completely. Okay, how did they do it? Well, a couple of things happened. First of all, the, by, by, by focusing on getting things done, okay, and they were, that made them much clearer on what are they trying to achieve have we achieved it? If we haven't achieved it, what have we learned? What do we need to do differently? When they had two years and no, no concrete deadlines in the middle, things just kind of floated and, and never really got done. Um, the, you may have heard of the book, Jeff Sutherland's book, Twice the Work and Half the Time. He's got the proportions right, but, but Walter would phrase it differently. He would say we achieved all the goals, half the work, a 
quarter of the time, okay? But the thing that was important, the, the results were visible on the bottom line. They, they were able to stop hemorrhaging money and, and get into a profitable situation. What were the key factors? Well, first of all, his own commitment. Second, communicating why then what, okay? And so they used Scrum to improve the company, a fairly lightweight version, much lighter weight version than what you would see in the, um, uh, in the books, because as I say, they're only working 10%. So when you're doing an agile transformation, one thing to remember, okay? An agile transformation is a restructuring of the company. This is not something trivial. This is not something you bolt on underneath the company. Why are we doing this? Well, we wanna optimize for speed. We wanna optimize for value production. We wanna be able to innovate, okay? And finally, we're changing the culture so that we can innovate, so that we can optimize for speed and value production, okay? Now, how do you do this? Well, the short answer is start with yourself, okay? This is, this, this is kind of a classic problem. You know, this was the fake agile problem. The leaders were saying be agile without being agile themselves. So the place to start with is yourself, okay? And I'm gonna give you a couple of tips on how to do this. Um, and it's really about how you manage your work because most of us have got too much to do, especially at the leadership level, you've got too much to do because it's, it's, just, it's just incredible. Um, so our typical response is to multitask. Um, my, my polls or, or surveys on, on multitasking indicate that, that managers above the third level easily have 60, 70, 100 things they have to keep their eyes on. It's, it's incredible the amount of things that require their regular attention. Um, the problem is when you multitask, everything slows to a crawl and nothing gets done, okay? So you feel like you're working like crazy on all of these things, but you're not accomplishing anything. Now, if you want to have impact, okay, you need to focus on things that matter. But if you're working too hard, you don't have time to do so, okay? So if you want to have impact, you got to take the time, focus on the stuff that matters. And then just like that navigation example, you gotta be persistent, you've gotta be able to stay the course, okay? And it also means you're saying no to stuff that doesn't matter. Although having said that, it's usually a bit easier to ignore it than to say no to it, okay? Now, our developers have already solved this problem, okay? And this is actually the polls that I was showing. These practices that we associate with agility, these are widely used in software development, okay? If we look at, the polls in management. So let me just take a look and see. So I, one of the polls I asked was, how many of your managers are applying these practices? Okay, so we got 47 results. So I must admit, I'm rather surprised. These are much better results than I got the last time I did this survey. 64% uh, doing a daily standup, 53% doing iteration planning, 64% retrospectives. Now, one thing we have to be clear there, and I'm not sure that this, this questionnaire really, really captured it, are they using this for their own work or are they participating in your work, okay? But even so, we're seeing that, you know, the percentages are much, much lower. Um, and I will make a screenshot of this and, and, and share this so, somehow when I, um, I'll probably share this in LinkedIn, uh, the results of the polls so you can, um, uh, so you can see what this is all about, okay? So um, <clears throat> let's go back to Walter's case. How many of them did his team use, okay? And the short answer is all of them, okay? So if you start by applying agility to your own work, uh, there's a huge potential to improve your performance as a leader in your organizations through agility, okay? So if you wanna be the next Walter, um, this is, this is the question that I would ask. How happy are you with how you're spending your time or how your organization is spending your time? And, you know, once again, you know, the polls, let's just see. Uh-oh, where'd my mouse go? So I'm going to go to the um, how happy are you at work? Because I know we're short on time. Okay, so we've got, let's see, one, so three, five, 13, 16, 21. So if this were a net promoter score, we would have minus 21 plus 26. So we'd be about plus 5%. So we would say barely satisfied. Okay. And this is where, um, you know, this is where we see that there's a lot of potential for improvement in, in our organizations. 
Okay, so if you're not happy with the answers, start by applying agility to yourself. You know, get clear on what really matters to you. Be your own product owner, and then start managing managing the work of your week. Here are six questions to help you do it. The most important is what really matters. What did you do last week? That's the navigation question. Um, the next three questions are about triage and choosing what you want to do. So we say celebrate and choose your life. Last week you were somebody. Next week, you want to be a step closer to the person you want to be. Um, we have a book. I'll put the li link to the book in the chat. You can still get it for free. We're going out to Amazon. And at that point, it's going to cost money. We have ambassadors around the world. Feel free to reach out to one of us, and I'll sh share all of this stuff. And I see that we're running out of time. I don't know if my session length was, was adjusted for the delay in starting, but I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, pass the talking stick back to, uh, to our administrator, to our facilitators. And I don't know if we have questions or not. Um, if we don't, well, let's let's pass the talking stick back and say, what do we want to do now? It's okay, Peter. Even even we are a bit um, running short in time. I, I still would like to ask a few questions. Sure. So I also had actually my personal aha moment during your presentation. Oh, when fantastic! You know it's a bit funny aha moment, I have to say. But when you showed the slide with you uh, and uh, your picture, and you are with the glasses, I had my like, I've seen this guy somewhere <laughs> because oh. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't recognize you when without glasses and i remember i saw you in poland 2018 agile oh Bikes. wow okay <laughs> i was there so small world so yeah small world and, and happy to see you with us uh, today mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. actually the key question i wanted to ask is we have um also a co-founder of agile lithuania community is going to be speaking today alexei kovalov and i don't know yeah. if alexei you can hear me now i hope you do but I want to ask you, Peter, Alexei once gave a speech with a very interesting title. I, I, tried, I did my best to translate this title to English. Mm -hmm. And the title is the following, and I would like to get your comment on it. So the title yes. says, the one who isn't agile when they are young has no heart. The one who isn't waterfall when they are of a greater age has lost their mind. Well, someone has lost their mind. I'm not quite sure who it is, but um, <laughs> um, if you're not agile yet when you're young, you have no heart. If you're not waterfall at the end, um, <clears throat> you know this is a um, this is a take on at least at least in in German they say you know if you're not a socialist when you're 20 you have no heart, and if you're not conservative or liberal. Um, you know, when you're in, when you're older, then then you have no brains, um, and you know, I think I think there's some truth on that. Although the funny thing is, you know, Zurich is a city has has been run by by the socialists for a long time, and I, I've been here for 30 years, and it has become more and more livable. And for some reason, because it's become more and more livable, or despite the fact it's become more and more livable, it's become a very attractive and, and unfortunately very expensive place. But somehow people keep coming anyway, you know, with companies like Google turning it into a Silicon Valley. Um, so, so somehow I, I, somehow I think that that there's a false, um, um, how should I say? There's a false choice here. It's not. It's not either or. Um, I. I remember my first training with Ken Schraber, and he said, if you can define the process in advance and expect it to work, then go ahead and do it that way. You know, some processes need to be defined. They need to be efficient. You know, where agility is really necessary is when we're trying to figure out the problem. We don't know what the, what the answer is. We might not even know what the question is when we start. And it turns out that applies to a lot of things, like running a company, transforming a company, and this is becoming clearer and clearer to me as I move forward, you know, even running your own life. Okay. So if you think you know what the answers are, then waterfall is for you. If you discover that you need a change management process, um, then then waterfall is probably not for you, as I as I guess how I'll close that one up. All right, all right. So uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it was okay. great to have you with us today.